Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the coldest room in London. The, um, or maybe that's just the stage, I don't know. My name's Torsten Bell. I'm the chief executive here. You're very welcome indeed. We thought this morning it was good to have some light relief from Brexit, so we're going to talk about ageing. <laughs> I know everyone finds it very relaxing, but we're not going to talk about you as individuals. That's for you to deal with in your own time. The, uh, instead, um, uh, we're going to focus on briefly on the thing that everybody knows, which is the country is getting older, but really that isn't what we are about today. We're about how that is happening and what it means for really important things, which I'll come back to in a second. So what we're aiming to do is bring together a load of the demographic work we do with the Intergenerational Centre here, led by David Willits, with lots of the other work we do, which is based on the economics, particularly of local areas, and also the politics and the political economy of how a changing Britain uh, is what's driving the big changes that are going on underneath it. Now, to do that, we've published a long report today, Aging Fast and Slow. I can even wave it at you. It's got here. It's got a joke about a hare and a tortoise here. You see, you see, that's the kind of value we add um, uh, here. The, um, uh, which you can read the whole thing, but, the, um, but we're going to cover a short version of it briefly from Charlie McCurdy, who's actually done the research here. Um, and then we're going to hear from a great panel of people to give us their views on it and on other related things. So first of all, we're going to hear from Tony Travers from the LSE, who you'll all have heard of uh, over the years, talking about everything to do with local government and many other things too. Then we're going to hear from Professor Linda Gratton, not from the LSE, but from the London Business School about half a mile away, in the leafier areas of London. The, um, uh, you'll again all have heard of, uh, lots of things from Linda, but she, a year and a half ago, two years, published yeah. a book on the 100-year life, which is very relevant to what we're talking about today. And then we're going to hear from Professor Nick Pierce, Director of the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath, who has also, if you haven't read it, read, written an excellent article recently about the politics of ageing, which I think is one of the big understated trends of our time. And then we'll have time for about half an hour, 45 minutes of questions from you. So, Charlie, to kick us off, let's have your slides. Thank you very much, Torsten. Um, as Torsten said, it's a particularly long report. Um, I'm not going to cover all 30 charts, um, unfortunately for you. Um, I'm going to cover you the, the key points um, and hopefully a few maps for those of you that like maps. Uh, to start with, the thing that everybody focuses on as a country, we're getting older. In 1975, the average age in the UK, sorry, the average age in the UK was just below 34 years old. Now in 2018, the average age is 40 years old. Now this is partly driven by the fact that people are living longer lives, but it's also driven by the fact there's been fluctuations in birth cohort sizes. With most of the recent rise in the portion of people aged 65 plus coming from the large baby boomer generation getting much older. And these are the trends which have generally dominated the national headlines, with the implications for state spending taking a lot of the headroom. The thing which receives much less attention and is the focus of this report is ageing across the country and the implications it has for politics and policy. What do we know about ageing across the country then? Different parts of the country have very different average ages. So on the map, on the left, we've got average age by region and on the right, we've got average age by local authority. The oldest part of the country, North Norfolk, has an average age almost 25 years older than the youngest part of the country, Oxford. The map on the right also reveals some quite stark regional trends. The youngest places, the places in the dark purple, tend to be places in urban areas or student areas, whereas the oldest places, those places in the dark black, tend to be rural and coastal areas with places like in the southwest, particularly standing out. But what this map doesn't reveal is that even places very close to each other can have very different ages and age structures. So the, the chart on my left, your right, shows um, the population distribution between Brighton and Hove and Lewis. Um, having spent most of my life in Brighton and Hove, of course, this doesn't re reveal any of my biases, including this chart in the presentation um, and you can see just how different 
the age distribution is between Lewis and Brighton and Hove. So Brighton and Hove tends to have lots of young people, and that would have been me a few years ago, and then you can see it sort of petering out, and that's people like me moving to London. And then you have a second hump, um, which is people like Matt Whitaker at Resolution Foundation moving there with his family. Um, in contrast to Lewis, which has a high proportion of old people. And there's a much more serious point than this, um, which reflects lifestyle choices and explains why people like me and Matt would have moved to Brighton and away from Brighton. But not only are places very different in their average ages, this story of divergence has been increasing over the 21st century. So the scatter plot shows on the x-axis median age in 2001 and on the y-axis percentage change in median age over the 21st century. And the upward trend shows that those places which were oldest at the start of the 21st century are those places that have aged fastest. So that's places like North Norfolk and Malden. At the other end, the youngest places at the start of the 21st century, like Nottingham and Newcastle, have either aged slowest, or in the case of 35 local authorities, are younger now than they were in 2001. And this is the really, really important point of the report. Place becoming more divergent is the key finding. To hammer home this point about divergence, the map shows that between 2001 and 2018, places have become much more extreme in terms of average ages. And the map, which looks a little bit like a disco map, and I would advise not looking at it for too long and it will begin to hurt your eyes, as I have done, um, but I'm going to explain it quite simply. Um, on the left, in 2001, the places in grey and white um, are places that are more similar to the average um, of, the, uh, of Great Britain. And on the right, the places in dark red and dark blue are the places at the extremes. So what's driven this story of, of demographic divergence? To answer this question, the report uses quite a complicated academic method that I'm not going to go into forensic detail. If you're interested, have a look at section four of the report. Um, but there are a few critical parts that it's important to explain for the next few slides. Um, so, as the population ages each year, the average age, or the secular trend shown here, will go up by one year. At the same time, births <coughs> tend to reduce the average age as the deaths. And the general trend at the national level is that for high proportions of relatively young international migrants, this also reduces the average age of the country. And the next set of charts I'm going to show you, it's important to bear in mind that they're all relative to the national level. So, for our fastest ageing local authorities, the chart shows that it's mainly about a lack of births as a portion of the population and lower rates of migration compared to the national average. On births, this is explained by the simple fact that these areas, like Richmondshire, also have much lower proportions of women of a childbearing age. In contrast, the quarter of local authorities that have aged slowest or in some cases actually gotten younger, the difference is mainly about higher rates of in-migration in these places of relatively young people relative to the England and Wales average. So this includes places like Nottingham, Newcastle and Norwich, where there have been high proportions of 19 to 21 year old students moving into these places over the 21st century. But of course, there are always exceptions. So for some of the slowest ageing, or in fact places that are getting younger, it's not always about migration. In some cases, 
high birth rate relative to the rest of the country is actually driving down the average age. So my char the chart on your right, my left, um, shows the decomposition by household income. And there's obviously a lot going on, but I want to draw your attention to the left-hand column, um, where the big difference and what's driving down average age is the high portion of births in some of the poorest parts of the country. Now, this is really important, this slide. Um, we often hear that the oldest places that are being left behind are the poorest and often rural or coastal areas. But in this chart, uh, the lowest income places are both getting younger than the national average and are also places that tend to be urban and ethnically diverse places. Which brings me on to the implications for politics and for policy. First, the findings the primary finding, demographic divergence, is important for local government for finance, particularly for social care. The challenge will be to match different social care needs with appropriate ways of raising finance, like business rates retention, like, social, like the social care precept. On economic policy, having previously worked as an economic consultant and um, designing uh, a number of local economic strategies, I can tell you that there is often an obsession or an overemphasis on productivity or GVA as the sole purpose of a local economic strategy. Given what I've just been through, we need to think about how particularly pensioners and the growing incomes that they've shown over the 21st century can contribute to local economies. On political divides, demographic factors can reinforce the age divide that we're now seeing in politics. And our research has shown that older and younger constituencies have become much safer seats for the major political parties. Hopefully this has given you a flavour of the report and I'm really looking forward to comments from the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, Charlie, Tony, over to you. Okay. Sneak around the back of you. Yes, I'm really wary of the Make it alive. water though. Okay, well, um, first, uh, great report. Thank you for all of that and for inviting me to respond to it briefly. Um, I want to talk uh, about the findings, particularly in the context of local government finance. It's worth remembering that a large part of uh, local government spending these days is on social care, about half of it is up to 60% in counties, and a significant part of that is social care for older people. And of course, local government spending has fallen, revenue spending has fallen by 25% in real terms since 2010. So small wonder, therefore, there's a bit of a problem. The other thing that's happened in this period is that there's been a radical shift. The British local government finance system, or the English one separately, true in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, has for years been highly redistributive. We've had very significant amounts of equalisation in the system, probably more than any, I mean Australia does this to a significant but remarkable degree of equalisation. But since 2011, effectively equalisation has been frozen where it was then. So changes in needs and resources since that point have effectively been baked where they were almost a decade ago. And of course, notwithstanding that fact, uh, there's a kind of another event on another day to be held about the f issue of local government funding, which is uh, a mess, really, and viewed from every angle uh, needs reform. So we don't need to go into that in elaborate detail. But I've mentioned the fact that for all sorts of political reasons, deficit reduction meant cutting local government more than many other parts of public spending, local government spending down by 25% since 2010, NHS spending up by 15 or 20% in real terms in the same period. The local tax system is in need of reform, business rates, briefly mentioned a moment ago by Charlie, incomprehensibly in the middle of reforms. But the important point is that local government and every single council spending is effectively set by national government, unusual by international standards. And again, we've heard reference to the 
uh, social care precept, which has left us with a period where local government spending has simultaneously been capped to keep it down and then naturally pushed up uh, in order to get some more money in for older people's social care. And of course, that means the cost of funding social care has been transferred from national taxpayers to local taxpayers to a significant degree. And given the failures of council tax and its regressive nature, that has profound long-term implications. So, of course, beyond that, there are political impacts, which I'll just touch on briefly. I mean, obviously, cities, London, most obviously, but it's true, it was true in advance, actually, in places like uh, Manchester, Liverpool and Leeds, have shifted well to the left. London now is the richest place in the UK and increasingly a Labour voting city. Now, it's not unusual if you look at Paris and New York. Paris was almost, all, sorry, New York was always a, a sort of Democrat left-leaning place, uh, but Paris has now become sequentially the richest place in France and governed by socialist mayors. So there's changes going on here that are not unique, I suspect, to the United Kingdom. And of course, if you look at the general state of British politics at the moment, as we run into a general election, it's clear that the present government, uh, for all sorts of reasons that are nothing directly to do to this, with this that they are, is uh, thinking of find, finding ways of shifting resources to some of the areas which have got these much older populations, albeit for more complex political reasons. So, the challenge. Looking ahead, can local government resources be sufficiently equalised to cope with the changes highlighted in this report? Remembering England and the local government finance system in England is very, very centralised by international standards, and local government can only spend in any year what central government uh, gives it or allows it to raise. So either we have to have some form of new and more deliberate full equalisation, the government was going to hold a fair funding review as it called it, to come into effect next year, that's been delayed like everything else uh, into some point in the future. So either we have to have uh, a greater degree of more precise equalisation or frankly central government has to pay for everything. That's the other way of doing it. Um, and it's worth remembering just briefly, and just as I'm going to finish in a second, the history of, so of, of funding social care for older people. Up to 1992, it was 100% funded by uh, social security budget. So care homes were funded, and surprise, surprise, care home funding rose. Uh, the cost of it rose very substantially because it was all funded 100% by the uh, social security budget. The government then transferred it to local government, capped local government spending. Surprise, surprise, local government drove the costs down to the point where the social care system is barely uh, able to stay not, I mean, stay um, in the black. So it's very, very complicated. It's uh, in the red most of it, most of the time. So looking ahead, there is a major public policy failure, of course, which we all know about, which not discussing that uh, so far this morning, which is that the adult social care funding system is broken and successive governments post Dilnot have failed to do anything about it. And if you look at the most recent House of Commons Library, excellent document, it has a short deadpan description of it on the front page, which tells you all you need to do. So either care for older people is going to be trapped in local government with an all for all time baked in 25% funding cut with the impact that that has on the NHS or there is going to have to be some kind of reform to local government funding that allows the funding of services for older people to escape the particular uh, weather system that they're set within. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> it's an excellent reminder that social care is broken and not getting any better, and whatever I'll fix when it eventually turns up, when we're all dead, um, mm -hmm. it should take into account the divergence we are talking about. Indeed. Otherwise, it won't be much of a fix. Right, Linda. You. Thank you. Well, first of all, Charlie and the Resolution Foundation, great piece of work. Um, and I think what I really love about it is that it's got this regional focus. Um, there's a, a piece of work that came out in the US uh, last year which looked at automation at the level of regions. In fact, took a very, as you did, Charlie, a very, very detailed analysis. And the same sort of story arises, really, which is that place is very important. My own, my own area of research is, looks at demography and automation. And of course, if you overlay who's going to lose their job through automation, then you'll see that the sum of this 
older people tend to. So this is an important point. So thank you for really understanding the regional aspects and the point of place. The second thing I wanted to do was just brief, briefly talk about what happens when a country ages. And uh, for a, a set of reasons, I spent a year and a half, just finished actually, serving on a Prime Minister Abe's council in Japan. Uh, and the, which, of course, as you know, in terms of the demographic transition, is the furthest uh, country along that demographic transition uh, in terms of uh, uh, people living older, they're having fewer children, and there's very low immigration. So all of those three factors means that it's currently the oldest country in the world. But nevertheless, uh, in terms of the demographic transition, it isn't unique. It's just the first country to go through that transition to that extent. And the next one up is China, which is a very large country. So obviously this question of um, how do we think about an aging population, and Japan thinks about it, as you've done, Charlie, very much at the level of, of the location. And I wanted just to mention that these, that certainly in the case of Abe, he believes that to be so important that he has actually put a council together, which served for one and a half years, uh, made up of key people across uh, uh, Japan, including his ministers. I, I was uh, the only uh, foreign person on that council. And it came up with a whole set of recommendations about what Japan should do with regard to ageing. There's one thing that I wanted, two things I wanted to talk about really. One is, uh, and I won't say much about it except to say, intergenerational relations are very important. And of course, you know that very well at the Resolution Foundation. Japan is very, very focused on that, as indeed is Singapore. And I think that one of the things that we need to realize is as we create these homogenous places, it has dire impacts on the opportunity for people from different age cohorts to spend time with each other. And Japan is certainly very aware of that. But the real point I wanted to make uh, was uh, this notion of age being malleable. And I wanted to say that we have to be very careful about how we talk about age and how we talk about old age. And certainly Andrew Scott and I, in our last book, The Hundred Year Life, and in our new book, which will be out in May, push back on the idea that 65 is old. Um, in fact, actually, if you look at morbidity rates, uh, you'll find that really the new old is 80. One has to be very careful about saying 65 is old. And the reason I say that is because my focus is primarily corporations. I don't look at governments except, you know, in a sort of, it, my major focus is what should corporations do. And the most important thing that corporations should do is to employ people over the age of 55. And at the moment, they are very prone not to do that. Part of that is our stereotyping about what it means to age. And particularly in the regions and the, and the places that you've, you've found, Charlie, that, are, that have older populations, it's very, very important that we encourage our companies to employ people into their mid-70s. And uh, I think that, I know there's a long debate, and we had it very briefly before we started, about jobs and place. But I just wanted to finish by saying that for me, this is a very big issue. And if we have places in the UK where anybody over 55 can't get a job, then that has enormous implications on the, uh, the tax of, of the whole country. But also, we're beginning to realize that good work helps people stay healthy. So I think I wanted also to mention the corporate aspects of this. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Linda. <laughs> Not in this report, but in some other work we're doing at the moment, it's the increase in older female working, 55 to 65, of which, is a, like, which is partly because of the pension. Freelance work. Well, they're, 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 they're doing freelance work. They're doing part-time yeah. work, yeah. 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 Great. Now, anyway, Nick, back yeah. to you. Nick has slides. Just to wait for uh, <laughs> Are they up here? Can I? Hopefully they'll work. Yes, use them. Okay, yeah. Thanks very much indeed, Torsten. Thank you, Charlie, for uh, an excellent report. Uh, I'm afraid, Linda, I am going to treat the over 65s as old for the purposes that, of that, my slides. Well, everybody does. <laughs> Old, older. I'm um, speaking old. as somebody of that age, and older. that's one of the reasons. Um, Pushing against it. Uh, I'm just going to just look at the political aspects, of the, 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 the areas that um, Charlie finished on. This, this idea that age is the new class, that when we look at people's voting patterns now, age is a better predictor than income of how you vote. 
Uh, two big explanations of that. The first um, is the cultural backlash theory of uh, Ronald Inglehart and Pippa Norris, who argue that older voters are more socially conservative and they are reacting to the spread of liberalism in Western societies that wrote the vote for Brexit, for Trump and others, are a manifestation of a cultural backlash. Now, that, that assumes that there's something called kind of values that are distinct, if you like, from the, the rest of society. So you say that there are values over here and there's sort of class and ec economics over here. Um, others reject that. They would argue that actually culture and class, culture and economics, values and economics are, them, are integrated, if you like, in how we think about society. And they prefer instead to say that, that what really is going on here is the economic geography of the transition to a knowledge economy, that uh, older people are concentrated in post-industrial areas, younger people in uh, cities, the, where the high skilled sectors are, and that's what's driving this age difference in politics as well as in our values. Uh, and as Charlie said, however, these are these accounts, I mean, I prefer the second account, the economic geography account is a better one, I think, but it's hard also to reconcile uh, with uh, what we know about the wealth and living standards of older populations, uh, in particular, uh, home ownership rates and what's happened to uh, the incomes of older people in the in the 21st century, uh, they don't look very left behind, basically. Um, so uh, just to, to, to go back to what Charlie was saying, here you see the, the median age of uh, uh, the constituency in, 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 uh, represented by the main parties. We see that you know Green Party obviously has the, the lowest median age, but that's the Brighton and Hove effect. Uh, Labour, uh, young populations, uh, and actually interestingly, Ply Cymru has a a relatively old uh, voter block. But the Conservatives have older voters than the rest of the country. And then when you divide um, when you divide the parties into main blocks, so you put Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens on one side, and you put the Conservatives and UKIP on the other, you see big differences in the in the in the voting blocks according to um, age. Uh, so not it's not just a Labour Conservative split, it's also a split amongst, uh, if you like, from the centre left across to the Green left. Um, and some of the explanations of this have been that, uh, uh, that really the, the age divide is a manifestation of education. It's really what's going on here is that uh, people with um, higher levels of education are more liberal, more likely to vote Labour, Liberal Democrat and so on, and people with lower le levels of education are older and so on. And of course we do have big compositional uh, effects in the differences between age groups because of the expansion of higher education. The younger and the middle aged have much more likely to have degrees than older people. And when we look at the leave vote, the top uh, bars there, we definitely do see the red line is those with a degree. We definitely see a difference at all ages between the probability of voting leave uh, for those with no qualifications and those with a degree, although it closes as you get older. So there's an age effect there in addition to the, um, in addition to, uh, the education effect. But that disappears almost entirely when you get to the 2017 election. When you look at the second uh, chart here, um, uh, the likelihood of voting Conservative um, is equally low for those with a degree and no qualifications or um, other qualifications for younger people and only very uh, slightly different when you get to the older age groups up to the age 80 there. So uh, it, the, the, the education effect does not appear uh, to be able to explain uh, the likelihood of voting Conservative uh, and indeed um, uh, we see the, the older people uh, regardless of their qualifications, are more likely to vote Conservative by, by a considerable margin. Um, and in the work um, that this is drawn from, this is a piece of Torsten mentioned at the beginning, a piece I did in Political Quarterly with a colleague of mine, Joe Crisp, at the University of Bath. We then try to look at the economic geography of different areas to see whether these more left-behind post-industrial areas were more likely to vote Leave and Conservative, or, uh, in contrast to the higher skilled areas. And in the top uh, graph there, you, you do see a relationship between the proportion of people employed in the higher skilled economies, which is, uh, the, if you like, the green bars there uh, are the higher skilled areas, more people employed in those higher, higher skilled sectors like finance, insurance, ICT and so on. Uh, and the blue bar the least. And so you definitely see there that in the, um, in the post-industrial areas with fewer of those kinds of jobs, a high proportion of people voting leave, very strong for uh, younger people, and gets, gets more narrow until uh, a, a, as you get more over 65s in a constituency. But it doesn't hold for voting Conservative. The vote, vote share of the Conservative Party there is actually higher in the older constituencies, which have got... Uh, higher levels of uh, higher skilled activity. And that's basically the southeast of England. 
So these are the more prosperous areas that were voting uh, Conservative at the 2017 election. Large numbers of them also are voting Leave. In the, in, the, in the Brexit referendum, they were joined by more of those post-industrial areas, but a large number of people in those constituencies that in the South East and so on, as we know, voted to, to Leave in the referendum. Um, <clears throat> so what does that mean? Well, uh, whoops, let's go back one. Uh, well, there are class differences then amongst older people. Um, uh, age effects do start to decompose into class. And when we compare owners with renters, so people that own their own property with those who rent, uh, typically in social housing in, in older age, we do see uh, on the top graph there, more socially conservative values are held by both. But when we come to look at economic intervention, as if you like, whether you're more predisposed to support things like nationalisation, a bigger role for the state in the economy and so on, uh, we see that owners are much less likely to support that uh, than renters amongst the older population. We, see to, we start to see differences in attitudes to economic intervention and the welfare state, there's also evidence about this in the welfare state, emerging depending on your, on your class background for which this is a, a proxy. The issue of course, however, uh, as the Resolution Foundation has shown on many occasions, is that the percentage of over 75 uh, who are, percentage of over 75 who are homeowners is itself over 75%. So your compositional issues here are massive. You've got huge numbers of people owning their own homes who are much less uh, predisposed to uh, voting for economic intervention. And that, in the words of uh, David Willits, Lord Willits, is that they are much more likely, therefore, to be insulated from the effects of Brexit, much more likely to be insulated from uh, disturbances to their economic well-being than they are likely to be left behind. So understanding this age divide simply as a manifestation of being left behind either culturally or economically, I think, um, uh, is an inadequate explanation. We have to get much more into some of these differences that relate to people's property wealth, the welfare state, and how they've benefited, particularly since the financial crisis, from both monetary and fiscal policy. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Nick. I don't know whether the IT is up to this. Actually, why don't you pass me that, Nick, and I'll use it on that rather than... I'm going to, before we go to some q and I want to give you all a chance to... Um, if this works. Where do I point this thing? Or does someone look... Are we allowed a map back there, guys? I'd like the, the dark... I thought dark... What, what um, Charlie called the disco map. Oh, you get that up while we are... Uh, and then we'll talk. So here's, here's the question for you guys, OK? Which is... OK, so we're saying as a fact... The country is diverging by age. The gap between places on average ages, that's, exact, that's the excellent mm. disco map. Right. It is getting bigger, which is a, this is just showing you that. The colours are becoming more stark here, which is showing their gap from the national average. Yeah. If, there are, if the colour is stronger, it's further away from the national average than it was back in 2001. So the question is, on both, let's separate out economics and politics and do the one at a time. Okay? Is that good or bad for the country? Like, what, what is going on? How, mu how much should we worry about this? Should we think it's a really good thing? How does it change what we think about it? So why don't we, let's do the economics first. Tony, is it good or bad that we've got bigger age gaps? It'll certainly make um, the measurement in all of these, not only for local government, but in the NHS and elsewhere, measurement of precise measurement of need and justifying change more difficult. In a highly centralised system where you've got uh, these formulae that attempt to measure quite with enormous precision needs from place to place, then clearly the more they diverge, the greater the difficulty of explaining, because you, effectively you're gonna to have to take resources away from the white dots and give it, and um, actually some of the, well, some of the darker dots on one kind and give them to the darker dots on the other. And all I'd say is that's disruptive and quite difficult for politicians to explain. Linda, good or bad? Altogether bad. <coughs> and the reason it's altogether bad is that from an economic perspective, a creativity perspective, a happiness perspective, uh, people are happier in intergenerational relationships. Younger people like spending time with older people. Older people like spending time in, with younger people. Families were the place that that happened. That's not so ha ha happening so much now. So now it's neighborhoods and communities. People at work learn from each other if they're at different ages. It's very important that we build a society where different age groups have an opportunity to spend time together, being educated together, caring for each other together, playing together, learning together. That is very fluffy, Linda. Look at all this bonding that's going to take place. 
my mother's looking after the kids. Thank you. My mother's looking that. after the kids today, so I'm very perfect. There you go. I'm very pro See? this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Neither of their welfare is improved by this fact, but they are. <laughs> but it's definitely happening. They're a lot happier. Okay, right. Just to, like make this a bit perkier. Yeah. Okay. On here's two reasons why it might be a good thing. Okay, I go. The, on. the first thing might be um, that it's not. Um, people might just have different preferences. Okay. So living in some bits of London when you're a bit older is a massive hassle because everyone's bloody running around all the time there and it's just quite uh, it's stressful and not all of it's really pretty. And if I've got a choice about where I want to live later in life, maybe I just maybe it's just an expression of our choices about where we want to live in different phases of our lives. One second bit of perkiness is maybe in a world where we're all worrying about how we get higher incomes in places where productivity growth is all happening in city centres and we're spending our time worrying about all these places being left behind with lower incomes, the fact that we're getting this age divergence happening at the same time as a GVA divergence, i.e. the producing is happening in a narrower range of places, but we're pushing the now richer part of the population, the pensioners, out into other parts of the country, it's actually providing an equalising effect on incomes for the whole country. So we're getting well-off pensioners propping up the pretty places. That's a result. <laughs> we can tax them for social care. Result. There And the poor young people can get on with producing some stuff in the city centres. So maybe it works economically. I mean, I'm, just, I'm trying to find some balance here. But maybe both on everyone's perky and it's getting incomes to be better spread around the country. Maybe it's just better. Nick? Well, I think on the politics of it, it um, no, no, we're on economics, okay. not on politics. Right, yeah. on politics. Okay. I mean, I, I would have said that um, it does depend on which kinds of areas uh, are aging. So the class differences I talked about at the end there, I don't think anybody would think it's a good thing that um, parts of the, you know the, the 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 British coast, the post-industrial areas, have neither wealthy older people nor the economic dynamism uh, that younger people bring to the cities. So, so those areas that are ageing by virtue of being both uh, post-industrial and uh, older in their age profile but yep. don't have the benefits of the pensioners with high incomes um, and with housing wealth uh, are the ones that will lose, lose out most. Um, so, so, so that question, which you know, the Brexit referendum was supposed to oppose to us all, uh, has not been at all answered, I think, in, in economic or regional policy. It's not at all easy. I mean, we've had a century of regional policy trying to address these things, and not much uh, ha has, has worked. Um, so, you know, what it means for, say, for example, how you think about the politics that overlay your economic geography for combined authorities, city regions, much of the data Charlie's you know, putting forward here is local authority based, many of the answers are likely to come at combined authority levels, uh, if not regions. I mean, I'm, I'm more sceptical of the RDAs and regional government, but I think something like the, I mean, ensuring that the combined authorities can begin to reach those areas will be important, I think. Charlie, perky or not perky? Um, I'm going to say it depends. Um, I'm that's that's very my, decisive of you. I'm going to put my local economic development consultant hat back on, and I think it depends how Local economic decision makers are able to respond to this divergence. Um, my big worry would be that the first thing which tends to have gone in lots of local authorities is the economic development capacity of those local economic decision makers. Um, so whether or not they can respond to this story of divergence and if they've got, if it's younger or older populations, whether they can work with that, then that could be a good thing. Okay. Now Nick, go on politics then. Well, um, I think first, Firstly, I think um, the age divide in politics suggests that parties that will be successful in the future will be able to generate cross-generational, intergenerational alliances in the way that in the 20th century people generated cross-class alliances to win elections. Um, and so the sorts of policies that can appeal to both young and old, that bind them together, whether it's care, childcare, social care, these kinds of policies, housing, uh, they will be at a premium for political parties that want to be successful in the 21st century. Uh, the difficulty we have in the UK is that our first-past-the-post system uh, forces you into choice, but, you know, in most constituencies, uh, into a choice between two main parties, so-called Duverger's Law, that, you know, you, that, that the electorate will vote for one party if they think only one, one can win and against one competitor. Um, and, and in the absence of any proportional voting systems, that will tend to lock parties into their voting bases, as you've seen in your slides, and, uh, and therefore you then become um, predisposed, uh, incentivized to respond to 
younger or older generations. And if you're, if, you're, if you're sat on top of an older vote block, as the Conservative Party currently is, with much higher levels of registration, much higher levels of turnout, that are increasing in numbers you know, and, and as a proportion of the electorate as a whole, your incentive to respond to the needs of younger people or the middle-aged is much, much weaker. Whatever you say about tuition fees and all the rest of it, you know, your policy incentives go to, to, go, to go to older people. And that is a problem. So the combination of first past the post and this consolidation uh, of age divides in different areas uh, could reinforce uh, the age-divided politics rather than helping to overcome it. I'm going to be fluffy again. Um, I'm going to again talk about intergenerational cooperation, how important that is at the level of the neighbourhood. I'm going to talk about uh, empathy across generations and this idea of the veil of ignorance, you know, if you don't know what it's like to be 65 or if you don't know what it's like to be 25, it's very difficult to empathise with that. Both Denmark and Japan have run um, processes at the level of neighbourhoods and at the level of regions where they've asked people to imagine being a 65-year-old and they've asked them to imagine being a 25-year-old and said, what would the policies be if you were that person? And I think that's really important. And what they found, and you're not surprised here, is that people came up from, with different policies depending on how old they thought they were, they, but also more empathic to what it is to be in that age group. So I, again, as I said earlier, um, speaking, I suppose, as probably the only psychologist on the group, I do think that the benefits of intergenerational cooperation outweigh any of the disadvantages that we've talked of. Tony? Well, I know you were trying to be uh, characteristically challenging with your good news thing. My guess is that if we overlaid the older areas and the younger areas on these charts or the change areas with ONS measures of well-being, the older areas would, be, would have, have a higher levels of well-being. Big city, well, they, big city. They, or they, big, they would at the level. Big, city, yeah, yeah. big cities, the level of the interval, big okay. cities are, London in particular, uh, has low levels of well-being and self-reported well-being and many of the areas that are way left behind have much higher levels of well-being which is itself a complicated uh, phenomenon. The other thing I'd say is we haven't talked about it yet probably as well uh, in the context of public spending which I realise is partly political um, that the triple lock on pensions <laughs> the dear triple lock on pensions and the NHS is funding heavily skewed towards uh, the end of people's lives those, because they're rising in real terms all the time, are going to convey more and more public spending to areas where lower people live in the long term. And the rest of public spending is going to have to shrink year in, year out, unless the state grows substantially. Yeah. Yeah, that is definitely true. Now, on this, actually, the well-being thing has popped to a thought <coughs> in my head, which we haven't shown you here, but the place that's aged really fast is Northern Ireland. It was incredibly yeah. young. Just high levels of well-being in Northern Ireland. And it has very high and very fast-growing levels of well-being. Indeed. So maybe that's what's going on. Right, let's get your questions, guys. Hmm. We've got some mics on hand. Let's have Anita to kick us off. And then... Yeah. Um, Go sorry. ahead, Anita. Uh, Anita Charles is from the Health Foundation. And I want to ask two things. So I, I work on healthcare policy, and the thing that um, is really worrying me in relation to the geographical divergence is actually the provision of public services because all of our hospitals are in the cities and the people who work in these public services and for health and social care it's almost three million people who work in health care the de uh, uh, demand for extra workers grows enormously those tended to be historically younger people they are increasingly don't live where the people who need the care do which <coughs> brings into play either we're going to change the way healthcare and social care work operates so that people can do it for longer so younger older people can care for older older people from a work point of view which probably means things like 12 hour shifts can't carry on which is the entire way the NHS is, is, is organised or we're going to have to have at a city regional level very different kind of transport arrangements that enables younger people who want to live in cities to be able to, cut to, to, to get to places to work. And I think this is really important because in other uh, parts of the world that have this kind of I issue for longer, that their biggest problem with it is workforce shortages. So Tasmania, for example, 60% of their nursing vacancies <coughs> jobs are unfilled. 
and they could they could pay almost anything and people will not go and live live there but then that brings me to if we're going to do that that's huge list dislocation and a huge driver of policy to what extent is this an, you, a, an aging effect or a cohort effect so globally we see the rise of urbanization so in 20 years time will people like me all move to the countryside personally i hate the idea <laughs> you know <coughs> or actually is the, are, are we at the moment, you know, seeing just as we're reacting to rich pensioners at the moment, and we know in 20 years' time they won't all be rich, <coughs> are we reacting to a particular cohort um, that are behaving in a certain way, they're all retiring to the countryside, and actually the next cohort will live more and more in the city, and then that leaves a really quite fundamental question about what on earth we do about coastal areas and countryside. Okay, that's a, that's a great question and a good argument for reverse commuting. We're going to ship people out. Let's have Stephen and there's a gentleman here. Go ahead. Hi, I think there's something on what you, you said, Torsten, about the pensions redistributing income um, from, uh, to, to, to some of the, um, the areas with lower GVA. My father-in-law um, was an ex-Ford worker in South Wales. And he observed that it was all the pensioners, as he put it, in the spoons, jugging it up. And all the young people were paid to run round after them. Right. And because you had a lot of people there from the old industries who'd retired on very generous pension schemes. So the, the question then is, and it, it sort of follows up on what the previous question said, to what extent are generous pensions keeping these places alive? And what happens to the next cohort that doesn't have the defined benefit pension schemes? Okay, that's great, Stephen. But that's the long legacy of the deindustrialization income effect can take a very long time to work its way through the system. Go ahead, sir. I would like to say that the uh, that pensioners are already voting with their feet. The idea of retiring out to the countryside to Rose Cottage is yesterday's yeah. plan Already. for retirement. Nowadays, yeah. it is equity release, which means that we have a particular social problem that family houses are occupied by one or two rattling around pensioners, which blocks upsizing and is a big problem for the future. We have to look at ways of making downsizing more attractive to the pensioners. I know it's a terrible experience. I ended up in a resuscitation unit because of it. But you're advocating it. So you're advocating it nonetheless. No, no, I'm not advocating that. I'm saying we should make the process easier, more pensioner friendly. Okay. We Great need question. to make the process more friendly for everybody, but pensioners. In okay. Particular. Now, just just to clarify some of what we're saying on this on this. We're not saying that the ageing divergence is being driven by old people getting to kind of 65 and then retiring out to the... So there's some of that going on, but it's much more to do with these places. You're not having loads of births happening in those places in the first place because there's no women who are of the age where that's going to happen often. The, um, uh, so it's not... And the, tra the movement is actually happening earlier in life in general. So it's not, we're not saying that loads, this is not about rose cottages. Don't worry, Anita. When you're not going to. You're, you're not going to be forced out. No, if you were going to move, you'd have moved. It's fine. Like you're, you're staying put. You're there for life. The, um, right. Okay. Let's deal with this. So, first of all, on Anita's question about this comes to what some of what you're saying, which is the people who need care aren't living near the people that can provide it. Yes, uh, but I think the point the point that you make is a very complex one. Just a, a couple of general points about this. One is it would make a lot more sense for older people to live in cities, and I think. I think that's lots of people are now agreeing with that. That's a general view, isn't it? It's much easier to look after older people. Certainly, if you look at countries with older populations, and I'm thinking uh, now of, of South Korea and Japan, both of them have enormous investments in robotics. The UK has been very poor in investing in robotics, but actually, if you take a look at what uh, Japan is focusing on in terms of its leading the world as an aging society, much of that will be around using uh, ro robots to move people around. And we may say, you would not want to be cared by a robot, that, but the truth is you would. Uh, it, you know, if any of us would either have our child putting us on the, the, uh, the toilet or a robot, almost all of us would prefer a robot to do that. So I think, that, and then 
And then the third point thing I want to say, and again, nobody's really spoken of it, but I think it's crucial that, he that we can age healthily. And I, we're all seeing 65, when uh, just the way we're talking about older people makes it sound as if we expect them all to be, I don't know, I just, I don't like the stereotypes we're using in this room, actually, about older people. I think they're wrong. And I think that they create problems for themselves. One of the, th I was in Singapore last week, and one of the things the Singapore government has done is sort of stop government using stereotypical points about older people. And I think we've got to do that. I mean, people will have to work into their 70s. There's no question about that. You know, David knows that better than anyone in terms of pensions. We, could, we should encourage people to live healthily. And we should encourage organizations to provide, to, to, to not be stereotypical about, about working. And there's a, general, there's a general thing, which is high longevity and living longer is a good thing. So. Of course it's a good thing. I mean, you know, it's, we're given, we are, we've been given extra years. It's very sad that we, all that we can talk about is older people, you know. Oh, God. Well, I'm mainly thinking all the people in North Norfolk are having a I great mean, you're going to live to 100. Wouldn't that be I'm, great? I'm definitely honest. The family dies young, they're all useless. No, you, you'll yeah. be Dodgy here. Dodgy hearts. You'll be here forever, let no. me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Lucky audience. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like that. <laughs> Don't it? Um, all right, well, just to take the issue of incentives to use property more effectively. I mean, yet, yet again, you know, I only say one thing and this is it, really. Um, you know, if we were to have a functioning local domestic tax system, it would have that precise effect. However, it is untouchable precisely because of the fact that any suggestion that we ought to have an annually varying um, base for local domestic taxation, which would be the logic of such a tax, would, because the, such a long period since it was last uprated, last revalued, would lead to enormous changes. And the people who lose most are exactly the people you want to incentivize to leave their homes, tend to be people who are often homeowners, as we've heard earlier, and relatively older, if I can use those terms, relatively older. And um, we need a functioning local government funding system with a ta local tax that works and sends signals about the value of homes and whether those values should continue to go up or whether people should use property more efficiently and so on and so on. But the truth is, I only say this for form's sake because nobody's ever going to change it. <laughs> right, well, that's very perky. <laughs> Nick, anything you want to add before we grab some more questions? Yeah, I'm, I just, uh, I mean, I think Anita's points are, are, are really well made, and I think they're compounded by the fact that we probably relied on Eastern European migrants to yeah. quite a lot of that, um, travelling into the rural areas that um, previous waves of migration had not reached. Um, and so leaving the European Union, unless there's you know, provision made for this kind of migration, it's going to be even harder. Um, and I think on the question of, you know, DB schemes, I mean, I, you know, it, it's certainly true that, you know, we've, we've had quite significant pensions reform in the, in the UK in recent years, you know, the increase in the state pension age, um, auto-enrolment and so on. But well, people are being auto-enrolled into uh, occupational schemes, DC schemes, which now uh, are going to be worth so much less because of the collapse in annuity rates. Yeah. So, the, the, you know, we, we focused a lot, and I certainly did in my presentation, on, on, what, the, on what the state is offering people and how housing wealth has underpinned some of these kind of voting patterns in recent years. But we are yet to see what will happen to large cohorts of people who are saving a lot more into pensions. Mm -hmm. There's been a real success, the increase in auto-enrollment auto has made into, into these schemes, but their value is far worse than it would otherwise have been because of the collapse in annuities. And I, I'm not sure we know the, the consequences of that yet and what that might mean. We are seeing an increase in pension of poverty because of the cuts to housing benefit. Those who are reliant on, on the housing benefit are seeing their uh, incomes um, undermined by it. Um, and one final thing, on, on just on the question of equity release and the incentives to leave the cities, I think if, if you still have pressure on land and pressure on values of properties as a consequence uh, in the cities, there will still then be a differential between what you can get from selling your house in a place like London and what you can then buy and, and, and effectively do by equity release by selling. And that, so, so you see a lot of that in the, in the wider southeast, in the coastal areas. Uh, of, of the south that people have sold up in London and moved to those areas and they've capitalised that gap between property prices in London and those in parts of the, uh, in the rest of the um, wider south. And I think, you know, as long as you still have that differential because of pressure on, 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 uh, on the supply of land in cities, um, then you'll still see a differential in prices that will be expressed in people being able to sell up and move out. Yeah. Great, let's get some more questions. There's one right at the back there. 
and then one at the front here. Uh, two at the front. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Mary Dushevsky, a journalist. Um, I've got one comment and one question. Um, the comment is for Tony Travers. Um, I was surprised that you said um, a significant part of social care funds um, went on the elderly. Um, because, as I understand it, that isn't true. Um, that at least half of the social care funds go for working age adults. Um, and I wish those two categories were actually separated because it allows people to assume that the whole of what is seen as a generous social care budget um, goes on, quote, the elderly. Um, <coughs> the question is something that, um, that Nick has just, uh, just sort of addressed, which is, I, th I, I wonder whether it isn't um, a bit of a mistake to see um, property ownership as this huge advantage for um, people with pensions because first of all it's today's pensioners today's new pensioners are already suffering the effects of low annuity rate practically negligible annuity rates um, so you know th this is already happening plus the the value of home ownership may be traded in to an extent by um, downsizing or by um, equity release but I think the majority, the, the minority of people are doing that. Um, and for most people, the value of their property is either, it's either going to go to social care costs or it's going to the next generation. So I think to see it as this huge advantage um, to the pensioners it may actually not be true. Great, question here at the front. Um, what, um, nobody on the panel so far made any suggestions of how you start changing the, the demographics and we need to increase the number of young people staying or moving to coastal towns where currently they're struggling. And there seems to be an obvious incentive that could be established, it would be a rather expensive one in the, first, in the initial time, is to ask universities to establish campuses in those coastal towns where the students don't pay fees. That way, either the people who live there already might go to their local university campus and stay in their town, having gained skills and possibly then invest in their local area through those skills. Or you might attract people out of the cities into the coastal towns to do their university education and therefore change the demographics of those towns. At the moment, all we're doing is saying we're assuming it's going to carry on like this. You've got to change government policy to genuinely invest in coastal towns and university campuses is a starting point. Okay, great. Yeah, first of all, I just wanted to agree with the point that's just been made. The, um, I had two reflections on the debate, but our own analysis, the resolution analysis that we're releasing today does show a, one of the crucial drivers of this demographic change is university towns and concentrations yeah. of students. Yeah. And as the English higher education system in particular is one of the advanced Western world systems that most depends on residential universities to which young people travel and live in the residential community of the university, we are particularly susceptible to this kind of demographic change. And in, but however, in many countries, states and cities use the university as an instrument of demographic competition. That's why American yeah. states yeah. invest in their state universities. It was the origins of the very ambitious university system in Germany. So I completely agree with the gentleman that there is an obvious way forward that should be the key part of a local economic plan. And indeed, as we can see that the number of students is going to carry on rising, we're going to have more participation from disadvantaged areas. Uh, in fact, the last Labour government did do a very interesting consultation on higher education cold spots, yeah. which was the start of a competition of where you might create more universities. And as soon as we break free from the sort of idea that somehow we're going to have fewer people going and accept this trend is going to carry on, you meet, and we don't want all our individual universities to be massive, mm -hmm. there is obvious um, scope. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you need to tell students they don't pay the fees. I think what you can do is you can start with an FE college and it needs to be able to offer degrees in partnership with a well-known university. And it's a, it is by far the most striking policy proposal I think that follows in this analysis. I just wanted to make, if I may, a second comment on particularly what Linda was saying. Because although I agree with most of what she said, this question of the family versus other forms of intergenerational mixing I think is 
important. And the when we try to track in the intergenerational centre why younger people's pay was low, one of the reasons was they were less mobile than they yeah. used to be, less geographically mobile. Part of that is that rents in high-wage areas are high. But there is also some quite important empirical evidence that when you <coughs> go to the bank of mom and dad, yeah. one of the things that the bank what? of mom and dad expect as yeah. an implicit condition for helping out with your housing costs is that you'll stay living quite nearby. <laughs> and it's a, it's a kind of intergenerational deal where they quite look for, they may help out with the kids when they're younger, but they're also kind of thinking, and the kids will help out with, with us when they're older. And actually the family, what's really happening in Britain, is the family is becoming the more important place where intergeneration exchange happens. I personally think we've become too dependent on the family as the location for intergeneration exchange and there's not enough happening in other environments. And I suspect sadly that the dependence on parents for housing finance lowers geographic mobility for kids which in turn lowers their long-term earning prospects. There you've got a deep insight into David's family. <laughs> his relationship with his children, the forms they're going to be required to sign. <laughs> like, they, it's fine. Renters, Tolson. It's fine, it's all right. Renters for now. <laughs> but excellent. Right, okay, we've got loads of great questions there. The, um, uh, Tony, briefly on social care on working age population, which Mary rightly points out per unit is actually more expensive, I think, isn't it? Yes, no, I wouldn't want, I hope I didn't suggest that didn't. it was the whole of the adult social care budget, but the funding of older people's care in homes has clearly become a major issue as that segment of the population has uh, grown. And, you know, the failure of successive governments, you know, we're reading about Theresa May's efforts in the press day by day as we speak to, um, you know, find a solution to the funding of, of that ra rapidly growing, or was at least a recently rapidly growing segment of the population, and properly to fund its um, social care, just remains unfinished business. And it will, of course, have a profound effect on the amount of resource available for working age adults and indeed for children in social care and the other part of social care. So there's a broader social care issue. I completely agree on that. Just one other point. On the university's point, uh, it would be necessary, I think, to ensure that because of the highly stratified nature of HE, that as where the whole sector contributed to it is all I would say. Um, because otherwise, you can imagine some universities would be encouraged and do it, and others wouldn't, is all I'll say, to put it kindly. In, given that you, you're offering lots of international examples, including Japan, are they on this policies to actually rebalance? generationally across the countries. Have you seen anything? I think it's really, really difficult. Um, I, I love. I think the point about the university is absolutely right, that government could play a role. Singapore has done that. I mean, Singapore, as you know, has used universities specifically to build communities to, and also to build, to build ecosystems. And I think, you know, the point that you make about universities is absolutely right. And I, I'd like to add two points to that. One is, um, if when we move from a three-stage to a multi-stage life uh, a journey, as I'm suggesting will happen, then there's no reason why you only went to university once. So we don't need to use the word university and young you know, combined. Be, but there's no reason why people who are of any age couldn't go to university. But the second point is that universities are a creator of work and creators of jobs, and we can see that right across the UK. And Singapore, I think, has understood that better than most. And so where you locate a university doesn't just <coughs> impact the demography, it also profoundly impacts where how jobs are created, and mm. particularly entrepreneurial, because there is data that, that people over 50 are, are good at starting up businesses, and I think that might be another. The question on families, I think, David, is um, really interesting, just as a point on that. I don't think we, maybe I don't know this, but I don't think we do enough research in the UK on families. I think the US has been, through some of their think tanks, has been very, very focused on family structures. I don't think we have in the UK. So the point that you and I could debate this, and I don't think either of us have enough data to, to, to sort of know what's happening with families. My own personal view is that, there are, that, that, that we haven't thought enough about them, both in terms of corporate policy or, in, or government policy, the role of families. Right. Just, a, just a, I'm slightly worried about the love-in on the, so on the universities, there's definitely, the US experience definitely shows you that, that in terms of 
economic interventions that would have a demographic effect. Universities in poorer cities do have quite a big effect. I think we should be really cautious about saying that we have sufficient faith in the power of the state to open up a university in a small town very disca- and that the youth is going to flood in. Let's just be... I don't know. There, there are... There are well, that's my point. It depends which like, universities it was. I mean, it depends. Yeah. You know, a branch of some universities would undoubtedly pep up the economy of some okay. towns. It depends. Is that LSE offering that? No. Okay. Uh, well, I'm just checking. I'll go, now, I'll go back and ask Brighton, the colleagues. Brighton is so young because of a decision in the 1960s yeah. to locate a new university. Sure. Yeah. Taken by a country. Yeah. It, doesn't, it, doesn't hurt that, it doesn't hurt that it's an hour's commute from London. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. It's, it's, it's harder in some other... Great Yarmouth's a bit of a harder sell, is what I'm saying to you. All right, all right. Okay, we, right. Sorry, go on. Well, I, I, actually, I was in number 10 when we were pursuing that uh, policy of opening university centres and campuses. And actually, you get very odd patterns because of the kind of historical quirks in where universities were situated. So you definitely get a new university in Doncaster and Darlington. Um, you, you probably won't get that many more in Lancashire, which is pretty well served by higher education. Um, I do think if you want to beat the Brexit party in any one constituency, you definitely open a uni- university in that town. It has political effect. Um, Margate, exactly. It's a really um, expensive way of winning elections. But we don't, I mean, the problem with that policy at the moment is we don't, a, a is capital funding for actually this building the centre. And secondly, we don't have the strategic capacity in university funding to do that anymore mm. in the same way, David, as you know. I mean, basically, they haven't, you haven't got the ability, as we used to have with Hefke, to say, yes, we will open that centre and put more students there. Um, I just wanted to... Um, um, come back on this point about um, home ownership and, and, and its benefits. Um, I think the, uh, the issue I was trying to draw attention to was that um, the link between people owning property and voting uh, Conservative uh, is very strong. And it may not be that people are simply trying to, you know, a, a, gener- a, a sort of taking property ownership as a, as a, as a good thing. It's simply they may, be th- they may think that they can protect their assets best by voting in a certain way. So when you're trying to explain the link between home ownership and certain kinds of patterns of voting, the kind of patrimonial theories of how people vote tend to be good at those explanations. But I do think, in contrast to what you say, I mean, you know, if, if you own your home outright in recent years, you've had, you know, uh, interest rates on the floor since the financial crisis. You know, you're not paying the high rents that, that others are paying. You've seen a, a significant, you know, increase in your, in, in your, in your wealth. Um, and uh, you've at the same time had, you know, fiscal policy as we've gener- gener- as we discussing has been protecting uh, the welfare state for older people relative to those in, of the working age population. So it, it, f- I think it's hard to say that being a homeowner who owns your property outright uh, has been a deleterious thing for older people and doesn't, give, doesn't bring the benefit, I have to say. That is an uncontroversial, I think. <laughs> I think. I mean, what, you know, you're, you're, you have your statement of age is the new class. In politics, yeah, and when we say, well, I mean, the problem is we generally say, and I say that as well, because you can see it in voting patterns. Party party choice is now shaped by age more than it's shaped by the class you're in. But another way of looking at it is that age is literally the new class, in the sense that part of what was happening is that class definitions have flipped into being the economic divides have just got bigger by age than they have by your occupation in some in some ways. So people in poorer parts of the countries who are older still own their house, even though they're clearly a lot poorer than people living in. Chelsea. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, I, I don't think age has replaced the social class hasn't disappeared from our societies. It's simply interacted in very important new ways with age, when cohort effects of this gener- generation of baby boomers that has benefited from uh, rising property values and home ownership. Um, and you know, and there are still class differences out in how older people vote and uh, and their circumstances, as I was showing at the end of my presentation. Charlie. Um, just to emphasise the role of um, students in this story of demographic divergence with a quick example. So the two places which have got youngest over the 21st century, um, Nottingham and Newcastle, have at the same time had massive, massive increases in the proportion of young people and students moving into those areas. Great. Look, I think we should um, uh, wrap up. I'm at one free to there, whichever age area you're heading back to. <laughs> young, old, they're all great. Uh, so can we thank our panel for their contributions this morning? Uh, and thank you all for coming. We're going to be living in a demographically diverging country for some time. So enjoy it. <laughs> thank you.